Everybody, let's take into it. And Bernard, we're gonna mute you right there. Oh, we love whoops. you, but we're gonna mute you. There you go. Uh, everybody, feel free to ask questions, participate however possible. I will be in the chats and can help you with any questions you have. Itai, take it. Will do. Can everybody uh, see my screen okay? Thumbs up. Sure. All right. Today, we'll do a little more, more things, um, talking about some of the current events as well as some of the more macro uh, related emerging market and dollar. And I think some of the trader folks around the call may enjoy this one a little bit more. Um, all right, so let's start with our normal macro update. I think one of the most important things that happened during the last month was really this Fed pivot um, that we have seen the Fed actually moving into um, what is a much more hawkish stance. So. In the past, we've seen the Fed basically continuing QE and saying inflation is transitory. You don't need, you don't really need to worry about it too much. And you know, we're going to continue with low interest rates and in QE. What's really interesting is that we've seen in this latest testimony that actually happened last week, uh, the Jay Powell said that it's probably time to retire the word transitory um, when describing inflation. And it's probably good to think about other things that we can describe inflation with. So that's a very big shift for the Fed um, that I think everybody needs to take note of that. Now, why is he really saying that? Uh, looking here into um, the CPI, the consumer price index, going back all the way into the 1970s, um, as we well know, 2021 has been the year of inflation. We've seen the highest inflation, actually 6.2% in CPI, um, and much higher than that in some alternative tracking um, out there. And inflation is really the highest since the early 1990s. So the Fed feels as if it has to act and slow inflation in 2020. And Itai, a very rudimentary question, uh, but just to make sure we're covering it. Why does raising interest rates in the first place even lead to slowdowns in inflation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So the Fed really has a few tools uh, where rates and really the QE programs are two of them. And we'll talk about the, the QE programs as well. So they can increase or decrease the money supply itself which is QE and QT, um, which they, in this case, they are going from QE to, to neutral. Um, and they're also uh, able to tweak the interest rate situation. So what they can do is if they raise interest rates effectively, the price of money itself can become more expensive. So imagine you're buying a car. Um, as we know, used car sales have been one of the highest reasons for inflation up um, pretty, pretty massively. Most people buy things on leverage. We live in a levered economy where almost everything is debt related. So if the price of a car is the same, but now you have to pay 8% interest in this extreme example versus let's say 4% interest, then your payment is going to be um, more expensive. So that could potentially cool off rising prices. Thanks for that explanation. No, no problem at all. Um, so as a result, I think it's interesting to notice that the, the Fed funds rate, um, which is a tool to calculate the probabilities of where interest rates may fall a year from today, effectively December 2022, is substantially more aggressive than what the market assumed just very recently. So if you're looking at that, the market only assigns about a 3% probability that rates will stay where they are. And in fact, there is a greater than 50% probability they will be over... 50 basis points. So really the median here is three to four potential hikes by December of 2022. But that's not particularly enough. Um, what is much, much greater than that is that I think Powell um, said that they may increase the, the rate in which they're tapering. Um, they were supposed to wrap up their tapering programs in June, but this may basically be, be done by, um, by the spring. So substantially more aggressive uh, Fed policy. Now, why do we care? Why is this so important? And I think it all comes down to this following chart that we're looking at. So in red, you see the S&P 500 starting here in 2008, the global financial crisis. And then in blue, you're seeing the total sum of central bank balance sheet. In this case, it's not just the Fed, it's also uh, the ECB and the uh, Bank of Japan. There's been a really tight correlation between the amount of available liquidity as provided by these central banks 
and effectively what equity markets have done. So the general idea here is that when the blue line has been rising, um, so did the price of, of equities. But when we had a period like here in 2018, where there was actually quantitative tightening and the balance sheet of the central banks actually went down a little bit, um, there was a period of substantial market volatility. And then eventually uh, the Fed here introduced, I call the, it's, 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 it's almost like a stealth QE. Um, that was their reserve management program, which was effectively a type of QE at 60 billion a month. That caused the market to go down. Then this shock of COVID hit the markets. And then we start QE4, um, which was the most aggressive of any of these programs. And we've seen this equity market explode on the upside. So Itai, the way to be thinking about this is that as the as the Fed cuts cuts down on the printer, we're we're introduced to periods of higher volatility. So more ups and more downs. Is that something you think could potentially happen once the tapering is all completely done with? Yeah. So if history is any guide, um, then that is what we will expect. So in the past, when QE programs ended um, and markets normalized. Um, especially with rising interest rates. Um, we know that higher interest rates are, are negative correlated with the, um, with the price of, let's say, high, high multiple uh, tech companies. So the, the, the likelihood of substantially more volatility just increases. Cool. Okay, so it's interesting to note that it is happening in some places already. Um, so this is a really interesting chart. If you take the world and you exclude United States growth, so you exclude some of these higher growth stocks, particularly in, in, in the NASDAQ or S&P 500, um, you would see that the rest of the world was flat for 2021, um, which is remarkable given that there was over a trillion dollars going into equities. So what we're seeing is that the, the breadth of the stock market, meaning the amount of stocks participating in the rally continues to diminish over time. And you can see that going further back. You see here, this is a, a, a broader definition. So you see the entire world, all country index, and all you're doing is excluding the United States. What's really interesting is that the world has not yet recovered its 2007 highs versus what US performance has been. Now, it goes even further than that. If you're looking at the year-to-date gains from the entire global index, excluding the US, exactly as we said, but within the NASDAQ itself, which accounts for a lot of that growth, it's over 3,700 stocks, five stocks alone, which is Microsoft, Google, Apple, NVIDIA, as we know about the chip shortage, and Tesla are 71% of the entire gains of the NASDAQ this year. So if you didn't buy the index and you're picking stocks and you didn't have those five, you probably didn't do as well as you should have. So let's recap for a second. The Fed has provided the most unprecedented support for stock prices um, in 2020 and 2021. And they've purchased over $11 trillion in balance, in balance sheet money in 18 months. And what's that done is reduce market volatility, raise equity prices, and contribute to $56 trillion of global meltdown. So just think for a second, what does that actually mean if the Fed pivots and decides um, that they're potentially backing off from what they have been doing for the past two years? If they, when you say, oh, Rob, I think we're having a, an issue there. When Rob gets his stuff together, we'll, we'll ask him to ask it again. But uh, Itai, you can keep going. Yeah, not a problem at all. So it's even more concentrated when you're looking then at central bank liquidity, um, basically the Fed balance sheet, compared with the market cap of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Netflix, and Tesla. So we've even seen them shoot up recently more than the growth in the balance sheet itself, as we've seen more retail come in and people chase momentum in that sector. So- okay, I have a question. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Okay. So when you talk about, and hey, Rob, we're definitely still getting it. In All right, let me work on that. Hey, Rob, Rob, it looks like you're logged in on both your phone and the computer. So you're probably getting feedback from one to the other. That's probably why. Mute, mute the phone or shut it off. 
Larry, muting Rob Ross is a tough thing to do. Come on, you know this. Uh, I'll get shit for it. <laughs> All right, Itai, uh, if you want to keep going, and then after the slide, we can open up to some questions. And when you talk about the assets, are you talking about like bonds that the Fed has picked up for different companies? Well, the Fed hasn't been buying high yield companies for a while. They did that at the beginning of the of the COVID drop uh, when they had the ability to buy high yield bonds, but they didn't really continue with that um, after a couple the first couple of months. Uh, tell us about the uh, fiscal spending. Yeah, so, so what we've seen then in 2020 was the largest year over year increase in, in government spending since actually 1968. I found that to be interesting. 1968, uh, about a 40% increase. Now we had about a 50% increase. So I think it was interesting to see what actually happened during that decade um, and how it could potentially relate. I know we covered stagflation in the last call, but actually stagflation had a little bit of a prelude um, to what eventually caused that. So let's talk about the 1968-69 the cycle. So the 1960s were an era of relatively easy money that led to the drop of the gold standard eventually as liabilities increased substantially beyond what gold could cover. Uh, it was known as guns and butter. Why is that? On one hand, there were a lot of deficits to fund the war in Vietnam, but then on the other hand, there were a lot of social programs. I think it was called the Great Society. Um, which resulted in a relatively aggressive fiscal policy. CPI reached 5% or more, and then eventually the Fed uh, had to hike rates 300 basis points very, very quickly that led to a recession in 1970. So I think it's quite interesting. Um, I don't think we would be able to sustain 300 basis point increase now in a, in a year. That would not be possible at all, but on, in, during that time, it was relatively feasible. So you can see here, 1960s start with Fed fund rate being between two and 4%, historically normal. And then we get really, really high, really quickly, um, almost to 10%. And then Fed funds rate drops very, very quickly again, goes up very, very quickly again, and generally just a very, very volatile environment during the 1970s stagflationary environment where inflation is too much of a problem. You raise rates really quickly, you crash the economy, you lower them really quickly, and then you go back and forth uh, for a few times. So if, you so, were the, if you were the Fed chair looking back at this experiment in the 1970s to early 80s, what would you do differently and why? That's a really, really good question. And thankfully, I'm not Fed chair. They don't have a very easy job. Um, but I think, I think potentially what I would do, that's a very uh, controversial answer is I would let interest rates on the Fed funds rate level float on the market on a market basis. Itay, do you know, I know there's way, way more analysis now, media, you know, talk about finance than there probably was in the 60s and even in the 70s. But do you know, you know, when you're at two and a half percent, three percent in the 60s and, you know, four and a half percent in the 70s, what was the consensus where, you know, where people, what were the analysts, like the range of projections going forward did, did anyone see it going from, you know, four to 13 or, you know, I, I hear you, for instance, saying, you know, we might go up 50 bips or whatever it might be, you know, in the future. But, you know, are we maybe going to go to 13 percent? Yeah, I don't know if we can go as high as 13 percent, but I think the difference is really that post Alan Greenspan and then um, really Bernanke, um, the Fed wasn't really in the habit of telling markets what they were planning on doing. Right. It's actually only those Fed chairs that came up with the tradition of gradually telling the markets what they're going to do to give markets time to adapt to reduce the volatility. But I think before then, it wasn't uncommon for the Fed to get into a meeting and nobody having any idea what's going to happen because they were not giving any indication at all. And then they could come out of a meeting, you know, rates up 200 basis points, red rates down 200 basis points. So I think the markets were just not as transparent as they are today. Well, um, another thing, like along those lines, Ita, is like, for example, in the S&P 500 index, I'm doing my second book on, they used to not make the announcement on an edition until Wednesday evening, and then they put the edition right. in on Thursday. So yeah, there was just, it was just well. pretty common that we know best, we're what? the elites, we're the ones who run everything, right. and that this is what we're doing, live with it. 
they just and they just they just did it. They didn't have to worry about a lot, bunch of media backlash and back and forth. Yeah, that's a fair that's a fair estimate. Yeah, so the Fed has totally changed from 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 then where they just didn't tell they, t- they didn't telegraph to the market what any, any indication of what they're planning. Um, any other any other questions or comments on it? I guess what I was getting at though was more than what the Fed said. You know, just what the consensus is. You know, as to and the projections. I mean. Listen, while the Fed may have been quiet, central banks never were, you know, intervention, currency intervention, things like that, you know, they almost always get it wrong. So, um, you know, and I'm a contrarian, I know that, you know, and a skeptic, but I just tend to think that there still may not be nearly enough concern out there as to how dramatic this could be or not. I don't know. I'm just wondering back then if there, you know, if there were estimates at all, if anyone saw it coming. No, I mean, I agree. When I look generally at, you know, people's comments and what they think, they think, well, you know, the economy is going to be able to weather it and the economy is overheated and that's okay. So I, 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 I tend to agree with you. Um, sometimes a hawkish Fed could be very, very substantial to markets, especially if they take away liquidity that markets are dependent on. So you may very well, well be right. I don't know exactly what analysts thought in the 1960s and 70s. I didn't particularly look into that, but um, you brought it up. Actually, we'll probably dig a little into it after the call and kind of and and and, and see. Yeah, I, I may take a look as well. Yeah, and I'm well, not projecting more, anything. I'm just, yeah. You know, it's just wondering. more homework. Homework for Etai to cover for the next call. All right, good. Do you want to go to the next? Do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So here's another interesting thing. Um, you can see how the 1960s start with very moderate inflation, and then the Vietnam War happens. Uh, plus. Um, great society. Um, and this is interesting because if, if you recall, the U.S. only ended the gold standard in 1971, um, but liabilities were already increasing over what the gold that was available to cover them starting in the mid-60s. And the market already picked up on that with CPI increasing into over 5% and eventually forcing the Fed's hand to raise interest rates very quickly. So you're basically saying that, hey, everybody figured out we were printing too much money more so than we had the gold for they started calling our bluff and that basically forced the hand of getting off gold standard that's exactly what happened um this is also something really interesting if you look at the relative performance of the tech sector uh, versus the s p 500 what you would notice is that 1969 was the original tech peak uh was the original tech bubble in a way so You've seen the value of tech stocks, which at that time were obviously not as famous as dot-com era or even today, Um, but that Fed interest rate hike and then all that interest rate volatility um, with rising interest rates really until the 1980s have led to a relative underperformance of tech versus the S&P. But then you see obviously the famous tech bubble and where we are today, the relative value of tech versus the S&P is very close, similar to what it was during uh, 2000. Hey, Itay, I have something on uh, the previous the previous slide you had that's showing to take off in 65, 66. It, you have to also remember 1964 going to 65, and, and Larry will remember this because he was an old guy back then, is they took silver out of the coins. Right. And so, And I think that was 64 starting in 65 is when they actually took the silver out of the coins. So that was before the, the jumping off of the gold standard. And of course, in 69, the big tech stocks were like IBM, TI, I think EDS systems uh, were the big uh, tech sector at the time. And it was it was huge. That's why uh, that's why market history is so fascinating, right? Forget history. Larry was there. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to realize then this is still somewhat correlated with interest rates, right? And um, you did enter a period of relatively rising interest rates all the way until the 1980s, but then when interest rates were lowered again, you were able to, to see that because you're, it's, it's easier to be a non-profitable company and trading at a higher multiple where money is free and everybody's chasing growth because they can't store their capital and make 10 or 15 percent on their treasury bond. Um, okay, just a quick look at this. Um, and just again, this is not a trading indicator by any means. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit. 
Um, but I think this is interesting to look at the, the, the famous Warren Buffett indicator. Of course, Warren Buffett tells you he holds until the end of time. Uh, but the reality is he himself admitted that he's using this as a way to gauge for how expensive or cheap a market is, where basically he looks at a fair value of a market being um, the valuation of gross domestic product and the market cap of the S&P 500 effectively being equal. So you can see here as an example during 09, um, there was a 50, almost a 50% discount between the GDP of the country and the value of the stock market. But today you're sitting at about 209%. So the stock market is two times the value of GDP, which is very similar to what it was during the tech bubble. Um, and actually that famous 1960s period before um, the famous deflationary 1970s. So again, just, just something interesting to, to see where we are um, when it comes to these long-term indicators. So in 2009, Buffett had a lot of cash going to that, that he, he picked up a lot of uh, deals. Do we know how much cash on hand or percentage of cash Berkshire Hathaway's is that now? Uh, I actually don't know that off the top of my head, my head, but last time I read it was a few months ago and they, they were sitting on fairly sizable cash amounts. So he, he, he's just waiting for opportunity. Yeah, I, I think he would probably feel most, most equities are probably high they're, price. They're at 149.2 billion cash on hand as of November 6th, about a month ago. That is a huge number. Yeah, so he's he's waiting for the market to, to become relatively affordable again. Doesn't that buy like one share of Amazon or something? <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about some of these long-term um, interesting things. Now let's go into some of the short-term market insights from what's been going on very recently um, that I'm sure some of the more trading-oriented folks on our call would appreciate. All right, so first thing is not to confuse direction with pace. So you see on the top is the S&P 500, and then on the bottom, you're seeing the VIX index, which measures market volatility. Um, just wanted to illustrate really quick the difference between a more orderly sell-off that you can see there that happens a little bit slower, um, and then a little bit of a, of a recovery, and then actually a lower low in equities, followed by a lower high in VIX. And effectively, it shows no substantial panic happening, no positions being liquidated too quickly, versus what we've seen since the new variant for the coronavirus that may or may not be uh, a threat. But also, what I think is much more meaningful the market, to the market was the Powell testimony that he, in fact, announced a faster taper and took out the word transitory. So you can see that that took more people by surprise and the rate of VIX increased substantially more for a very similarly sized sell. Itai, really quickly, just for everybody that's not a trader here, can you quickly tell it, remind us again what the VIX is and why it's so important to look at, if you can get that done in just a few sentences. So in just a few seconds, the VIX is basically the price of market volatility, but you can think of it as um, the price of, of, of options on the S&P 500 and how much people are willing to pay for them. So if people are willing to pay for them more for them, they're expecting that there's just gonna be more ups and downs in the market, more volatility in the market, and they're potentially willing to pay more for protection. So that just means that what it, 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 could, it could be used in many, many different ways as market sentiment or market expectation of future volatility. Um, but it basically tells you a lot about some of the underneath under the surface things that are happening uh, besides just equity market. So the takeaway here is the sell the sell off before this one, kind of a normal rise in VIX, but this one for some reason, the sell off leads to a really steep spike in the VIX. So maybe you're saying that people have, are a little bit more fearful and trying to get some short term short term protection. Is that the way to interpret it? That could be a way. Another way to say is that there's too much panic and the market actually could recover. But it also tells you what market positioning was um, that we'll, we'll touch that in, in a second. Jeremy, I'm not sure that I see it that way, though. If you look at where he actually drew those rectangles, you know, VIX, the last time, 
VIX went up also as as the at the beginning part of that move. I mean, we don't know where this is going, but it looks almost identical um, at this juncture. Yeah. Well, VIX, VIX, VIX moved up more this time for a very similar size move, but also there's things under the surface like uh, the VVIX and a bunch of other things, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end if you're okay with that. Yeah, and I'm slowing us down, so I apologize. Okay, so one thing um, that I look at is the price of the VIX spot or where VIX is really at, at this time, which is the most short-term protection versus the the future spread. So the future spread really is the longer term futures. Um, you can think about it as longer term protection. So when there's a lot of panic and people are really worried about the right here right now, they sometimes grab the most immediate protection for the most short term that they can find versus if they're worried about more of the long term uh, of the market. So those things are very correlated, obviously. Um, one interesting observation is that sometimes when there's too much demand for very, very short term and the rest of the curve doesn't go up with it, like it did here during COVID, then that means that that move could be overdone. So you can see that here, you can see that here, and potentially you can see that here. We don't know necessarily what's gonna happen, um, but you can see, for example, here in February, March of 2020, those two move pretty much in line um, possibly signaling that that move was more substantial than, than some of these shorter term moves. Okay, so were there any warning signs for this kind of equity drop? Some of the things that um, managers or traders may be looking at in order to take advantage of some of these things to, to actually make money. Uh, one of these things that I'll introduce is cross asset volatility. So we live in a world where everything is interconnected currencies and interest rates and equities and commodities and money moves in waves. It moves from one part to another, to another, to another. So sometimes when you're seeing a really big spike in volatility of one asset or one substantial asset, like you did here, especially when that asset is very correlated with let's say equity volatility. So in this case, you're seeing in yellow, um, the Euro versus the dollar volatility levels. And then here you're seeing the VIX, which is the equity volatility pricing. Um, it's quite interesting, before this recent spike in the VIX, we saw a pretty substantial spike in Euro USD uh, volatility that was completely ignored by the VIX for just a few days, and then the VIX caught right into it. Um, just something to, that I found interesting. Uh, you can see in this previous example here, the VIX did, it was the exact opposite, where the VIX spiked and there was no spike at all in the euro dollar exchange rate. So just so, noticing cross asset volatility is interesting. So Ita, just just curious, how would a how would a trader uh, make money knowing that there's this type of relationship? And if they saw the 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 euro to dollar spiking up, what might somebody sophisticated have done to make some money there? Right. So there's a few strategies you can do. The most simple one in this case would just be to buy VIX. Um, you know, seeing this and just buying VIX. Another one would be to buy VIX and sell volatility in the euro usd which would be the more common one um and there's there's a few others but generally a sophisticated trader will be able to take advantage of something like this um this is another one that actually it, it was interesting that both of them happen more simul simultaneously the move index is the vix of bonds um, so we've also seen the move index pick up quite a bit ahead of equity volatility as well um, probably because they were already pricing in something happening at the Fed. That would be my, my guesstimate on that. Okay, so this is what I think is the explanation for why the VIX has, quote, reacted in such an aggressive way for a relatively small sell-off. I think a lot of it does have to do with positioning. So another thing that traders may be looking at is positioning in equity markets and what options players are doing. Um, so we've seen one of the more extreme positioning in the last few years, just before the big drop in equities on Black Friday, and then you saw the VIX going up 50% in a day when that happened. So if you're looking at equity positioning, there was a pretty extreme, I think there was an all-time high in, in call buying activity. And at the same time, this is quite rare, you're seeing an all-time in put selling. So traders were actually selling puts and buying calls, which is the most aggressive bullish position you can take. 
And reminding you that happened just before equities dropped on Black Friday. So no, that's if, smoked. So ex exactly. So with, with and then if the equity market moves the other way, they need to close these positions, um, which would cause the VIX to go up fifty percent in the day, just like it did on Black Friday. Um, you can see that here too. Uh, this one out of Bloomberg, um, they basically show that traders got out of the most traded stocks in the fastest space in almost two decades. And you can see that here too, where you're looking at net leverage rate of change. Um, so when you see net leverage drop very, very quickly, very, very suddenly, um, that we've seen that happen in this latest drop as well. Um, okay, I'll stop right there. I know this was a lot, so I wanna see if anybody has any insight on that. What's your thoughts on when leverage dries up as an as a opportune buying time? Yeah, I mean, typically, if it's if it's more of a classic pullback, garden variety pullback, I mean, this would be a good a good entry point. But of course, as anybody that's been in markets long enough, they know that you know this type of leverage uh, drop could potentially become a lot deeper. Like you see this in, I apologize. Like you see this in um, in the COVID drop. You know what was a normal move became much much deeper. But generally speaking, most of the time. Um, that could be a buy, a buy signal, but it doesn't always is the case. It could obviously become substantially worse. So that's where risk management and all these other things come into play. Uh, what other questions are on people's minds? I know we're going through some pretty heavy content right now. Okay. No takers, Itai. No takers. I guess, you're I guess you're we'll, gonna have to step we'll, up the game, man. I guess we'll continue. Yeah. So, all right. So this is another one um, that I look at again, talking about sentiment. Sentiment is important. Um, you can see here, this is the AAAII uh, sentiment indicator. I think this survey goes back pretty long period of time, 30 or 40 years. But generally speaking, they go once a week and they ask um, participants what do you think of the market for the next X period of time? Are you bullish or are you bearish? So it's not uncommon for peaks in bearishness to lead to bottoms in equity prices, but it's generally only, it's only viewable in the, in the rear view mirror. So once it starts ticking back down, then equity start ticking back up. And then you typically see these kind of bottoms play out. That's fairly common. Of course, sentiment can get extreme and bearish sentiment can become more bearish, but it's one of these short-term indicators that I know some, some systems are based on sentiment. Okay. Um, this is another interesting picture of sentiment, priced a different way, but it shows almost the same thing. So what you're seeing here at the top is the S&P 500. What you're seeing here in the bottom is the put to call ratio. So basically when this is higher, that means that puts are favored to call and people are buying more puts than calls. When it's lower, calls are favored to puts. Investors are buying more calls than puts. So it's interesting to note that when people need puts the most, they actually buy calls. As you see here in this previous example, when people are buying puts, a lot of the times, not always, of course, a lot of times it's too late, puts are too expensive, markets moves back up and these puts expire worthless. So it's just an interesting um, gauge. What is it about human psychology that leads to this, um, this type of action? I, I can yeah, tell so you that when people are long only portfolios, when they get scared, they want to buy insurance because they don't want the tax consequences of selling equities out of their portfolio. So they have a tendency to buy puts as insurance. And so as market, if people panic, they're willing to pay more for the insurance because they're protecting portfolio because most portfolios are long only portfolios. That's a, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I will tell the, the classic theory of why this happens is because imagine a scenario where the markets go down and then everybody buys puts. So if everybody buys puts, everybody already has insurance for further declines. So therefore, nobody has an incentive to sell anymore. And at some point, the selling dries off and the markets start recovering, and then everybody chases it back on the way up. So 
that's why sentiment works this way. When people lean in too hard in one side of the boat, it flips to the other side. But of course, you know, this reading is a normal elevated reading. Um, it's not crash reading, right? So you see the difference between where we are today and what a March 2020 crash would look like where equities are down 35% and the panic is substantially higher. Um, but nonetheless, when you do see evidence of real panic, when prices of puts and everybody's buying puts, a lot of times it does make sense to be a contrarian at those points and realizing that it doesn't make sense for everybody to be right on those on those positions. Good insight. Okay. Sorry. I like it. That was pretty extensive. And we talked a little bit about how to gauge sentiment and what sentiment means for trading. I'll see if there's any questions there before we hop into some emerging markets and dollar. No takers. No takers. It's time to hop into it. All right. This is an interesting topic. All right. So we covered first how just in 1965, we started seeing CPI increase. Um, so this is actually that crossover point that we talked about. I actually didn't know um, that the silver was taken out of the coins. That was That's really interesting. Um, so you can see here the, um, the, the US gold amount continuing to drop, liabilities increasing, and eventually liabilities becoming exponential, and the US just drops off the gold standard. So interesting to, to know. So in 1971, the, the, the gold standard effectively ends, and then we move into the petrodollar system in 1974. We've covered that extensively over a three-call um, series earlier this year. So if you're interested, you, it's, it's available out there and you can go see it. So I'm not going to cover that right now, but just so you know, 1974 is when that happens. So since then, we're on the petrodollar system, uh, where the US is 11% of global trade, 24% of GDP, but nonetheless, 40 to 60% of all global economic activity takes place still in US dollars. When it comes to trading activity, that's substantially more. Um, this, you, you notice numbers are greater than 100%. Leverage is used in FX on a normal basis. So the dollar has gone through substantial bull and bear cycles, and it's still the global reserve currency. So this latest rise in the US dollar, you can see on a very long-term horizon, it's not that substantial. Uh, the dollar's actually been flat for a few years. But again, this is a part of this bull and bear cycle that the dollar has gone through and still is the global reserve currency. So let's talk for a second about the dollar cycle, right? So it's very complex. There's a lot of shifts in monetary, fiscal policy, and all the capital flows that go out with it. Uh, but what's important to note is that governments and countries outside of the U.S. have huge amounts of dollar assets as well as dollar debts, right? So they have $13 trillion of debt, over $42 trillion of assets. They've built over many, many decades, and it's created a very, very sticky system that we'll cover in a second. The way that happens is that the first, first off, countries just need dollars to buy oil, also other commodities, but it's really oil that started all of this. So after decades of buying with buying uh, oil with dollars, remember it started in 1974, a lot of international financing actually happens in dollars and you need to hold dollars. Every country needs to hold dollars uh, to service their, their dollar uh, denominated debts. I was actually reading a piece of news today uh, about potential sanctions on Russia in the event that they will invade the Ukraine. And what they were talking about is taking them away from the SWIFT system and preventing their banks from doing deals in dollars as, as very, very serious sanctions in the event that that happens. So would that keep them from then selling their oil and getting dollars? I mean, the, the SWIFT system is how you move dollars around from one bank to another. I mean, it will, it will have a massive impact on their economy, which is still very, very much oil-based. So remains to be seen if they'll actually prevent them from being able to sell oil for dollars. Which leads to another good question. Who controls SWIFT? The U.S. does. I understand yeah, why they want to keep it around. Yeah, yeah. And they can see all the transactions that's happening across banks that are not even in the U.S. So the thing is, the, I guess the negative about why they might not want to do that is it doesn't just affect 
Russian oil, but it affects any other ancillary businesses that do business with Russia and back and forth. That would be kind of collateral damage if that happens. So it's not just focusing on oil money. It's any money coming in and out of Russia. It would just right. put a depreciation's halt to it. I mean, that's kind of the nuclear option. Um, so that's just an interesting news from today. Um, the dollar is backed by, so, so back to the point. We've, you know, decades of doing business in, in, in dollars and oil. At this point, the dollar is backed by both oil and debts. And those debts are denominated in dollars. So it's a very, very strong self-reinforcing cycle. Now, a lot of that debt is no longer even owed to the U.S. It's just global. So, you know, China would make a dollar-based loan to Pakistan to build some in the Belt and Road Initiative, as an example, because they all need to keep those dollars um, as a part of it. So question is then, why does the dollar spike during periods of crisis? We've seen every time, even COVID, 2008, when you get a really big move down in markets, why does the dollar go up? Um, you see that here, 2008 increase. You see that here. And I'm not talking about the gradual increase. This is more of a sudden increase, sudden increase during COVID. And the real reason is that there's a, there's a constant source um, for demand for dollars to pay back those debts. So when you get a recession and a drop in trade, in COVID, it was very pronounced. It was a really big drop in trade. Everybody wants dollars really, really quickly to make sure they can pay off the debts going forward. And that sudden demand for dollars causes it to spike. It's almost like a type of a margin call. And then a lot of times afterwards, the Fed involves, they print a bunch of dollars to satisfy the global demand. That's why the US's currency is so different than any other currency in the entire world. So let's, I'm gonna stop right there actually before we go specifically into emerging markets. That would be a great time for anybody that has questions. Uh, feel free to ask away. I think we're uh, we were liking it. Keep it going. Okay. So let's talk about the specific impact of the dollar on emerging markets. So when the dollar becomes stronger relative to an emerging market currency it's a type of quantitative tightening. Why is that? Because the emerging markets, because they need dollars, they borrow and they, they basically take out loans in form of US dollars. So if the US dollar goes up, what happens to your payment? Your payment effectively goes up as well. Goes up as well. So when you give me money to buy a building over here in Colombia, and this is happening, the dollar is strengthening. I now need more pesos to be able to pay back the loans. So I have to pay more and more and more to get just my hands on dollars. And you're still making your money in peso though, because your tenants in that building are paying you in peso, but now you need more of those pesos to pay back those dollar loans. So effectively it acts as a forced contraction for the emerging markets. It's basically a liquidity crunch for me sitting in Colombia. So that's actually one of the main reasons why emerging markets are so volatile. It's actually because of the dollar, the dollar debt. So they're sitting on these dollar debts and it can really create massive cycles for them. In the US, you may almost not feel it, but any incremental increase in the value of the dollar could have substantial consequences for some of the uh, emerging economies. But then on the other hand, during a period where the dollar weakens, um, it's almost like a quantitative easing program in the emerging markets, and you're seeing a big boom uh, a lot of the time when that happens. So this is an interesting chart um, going back here into 2003. And what I've done here basically is I've taken the ratio of EEM, which is a popular ETF that follows emerging markets, over the SPY, the S&P 500. So when this chart moves up, it basically says that the relative performance of the emerging markets is better than that of the S&P 500. And then when it moves down, it basically means that the relative performance of the S&P 500 is better than that of the emerging market. And at the bottom here, you can see the US dollar versus a basket of currencies. Um, so we've seen during this period until 2009, when the dollar was in a decline, we've seen the emerging markets perform better. Then the dollar was flat for a while. We've seen this being flat as well. And ever since the dollar really has been in a slow grinding uptrend, 
but we've seen the relative performance of emerging markets drop a lot faster versus the S&P. So Itai, one of the things I'm, I was just thinking back to your last slide, I'm trying to put myself in the position of being this one. The, the Federal Reserve Chair. And I'm thinking about how difficult it would be to create sound monetary policy in a world where literally every single person wants a depreciating dollar. How does somebody even come across and stay objective in one of those situations when everybody's cheering for your currency to become weaker? Well, but, but on the flip side, <clears throat> the Fed doesn't want uh, too weak of a dollar too because the US economy is different. The US economy is about 70% consumption and the US imports a bunch of stuff from, well, mainly China, but a lot of other countries. So a strong US dollar um, buys more goods as well. So it's, and, and it's not necessarily the case that the emerging economies want too weak of a dollar as well, because they also, it's much more complicated than that, because if a lot of them are export dependent and they want a weak currency as well, so they can export more and make more profits. So it's a really delicate balancing act between all these factors. So it's not an, as absolute that they want the weakest dollar possible. They're borrowing money as well, but they also have manufacturing. They're also selling to the U.S. and it's it's a really complicated um, it's a really complicated thing. Thank you for that. Sure. So it's important to realize it's more than just the dollar debt uh, per se. This is a really interesting chart that I found that shows the countries of the world and what percentage is a net commodity export. So take, for example, Colombia, where we are right now in the dark red. So you can see that more than 50% of Colombia's economy is exports of raw commodities. So we know that it's not just the debt and pricing the debt in dollars, but also the fact that all the commodities are priced in dollars. So a movement in the price of commodities um, also has a, a substantial impact over the value of emerging market equities, as an example, because that really dictates their profitability. And typically, a strong dollar has weaker commodities. We haven't really seen that this year, uh, but historically, that's been the consequence. So you can see that there's a huge part of the world that is still a net exporter. Or the economy is still very volatile because on one hand, it's dependent on the value of debt in US dollars, but then on the other hand, it's also dependent on the value of the commodity itself. So a lot of the world is not diversified at all, but it's really reliant on just a few things. As a result, you would see this as well. So a much tighter correlation between um, emerging market stock price in red and the price of raw commodities. So then to your point, when you have a steady dollar decline, so the dollar moves down gradually, you typically see a global boom um, where there's a lot, of, a lot of prosperity along some of these emerging market nations. Um, and if they're smart, they use this time to build a lot of foreign reserve, basically a lot of, a lot of um, foreign exchange reserves. So during this period, they have an economic boom, profits are up, equities are doing well, um, so some countries, when they're smart, they basically hoard up a bunch of treasury securities, basically, as a, as a, as a way to, to store dollars. Historically, they've been doing that. Um, but sometimes they take out dollar-based loans during a period of a weak dollar, which a lot of times hurts a lot of these emerging markets down the line. Okay. This is a recent example um, that I found. Again, that was, that was quite interesting. We all know that there's some type of crisis going on in Turkey, which is one of the emerging, um, emerging markets out there. And the Turkish stock market has done very well on a, on a relative basis. So you can see what happened just recently, went from 1400 almost to 2000, um, which is actually an example that high periods of inflation doesn't necessarily mean the stock market goes down, um, which some people may think that, that that is the case. And let's talk about Turkey's FX reserves. So these are their gross reserves. So if you're just looking at gross reserve, it's close to 130 billion US, which seems fairly healthy. But then when you're looking at their net 
foreign assets, it's substantially less than that. It's just around uh, just under 30 billion USD, which is very, very low compared to what's going on in their currencies and their level of inflation. But when you exclude the FX swap, so an FX swap means that there's an agreement between, let's say, the government of the country or a business in the country to take a loan in another currency, and then the other person is willing to take a loan in the local currency. So whoever took these FX swaps in Turkish Lira is not very happy right now, given what's going on with the Turkish Lira. So if you're looking at with excluding the XF swap, it's actually negative. So it's actually sitting on no reserve at all, actually being in being in debt. So, um, so what's the what, what are the implications of having no FX reserves? What what could that what could that lead to? So here's your implications. The uh, Turkish lira lost 40% of its value over the last three weeks versus the US dollar. And it's basically in full-fledged full -fledged collapse mode at the moment as uh, President Arduan seems to be in, insisting to uh, lower interest rates. Uh, I think he's firing heads of central banks, heads of, 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 of the economy, and he's basically pushing for low and low and low interest rates during the time of very, very high inflation, um, which is, and no FX reserve, which is causing substantial problems for their economy. So you can see here, the current inflation rate there, in Turkey is 21%. Are there any examples of countries that have had a similar type of uh, inflationary track that were able to curtail it and get it, uh, get it calmed down before hyperinflation? Or are they already too far? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can't think of examples right now. I would say, you know, this is clearly not the same thing at all because it's not an emerging economy. But, you know, like in the early 80s, when the United States had a high period of inflation, they raised interest rates to 15% and were able to break the inflation. But the US also was already the global reserve currency. So that's very different. For an emerging economy, it's much harder because they're not the global reserve currency. Um, and it could cause basically foreign direct investment to run away from the country and scare investors as well. So it creates an even bigger problem. Uh, so I can't think of any particular example, but I'll look, I'll look after. Thank you. Sure. All right, so last one then. Where is the dollar actually heading? And uh, this is more speculative than, than anything else, clearly. But as you've seen in this, in this call, it's really important to figure out um, the direction of the dollar generally because it's so important to um, so many different assets and it can impact emerging economies, it can impact profitability and many other things, including valuations, et cetera. So just looking since 2019, um, this is obviously pure speculation. You can see here that COVID margin call that initially spiked the dollar up. And then the massive QE that we've seen, the rate cuts, the fiscal response, um, the largest fiscal deficits we've seen, the dollar went down quite a bit. And then the dollar stayed flat for 2021 and actually started drifting up over the last few months, even before Powell announced it. When inflation started becoming a problem, the dollar already started going up, which is really counterintuitive because you would actually think it would be the opposite. But markets are known to be pricing things ahead of time. Um, so, you know, this is the period where inflation is becoming potentially a problem. Fed has already announced much more aggressive taper, potential rate heights to come in 2022. Um, we'll see what the dollar will do, but it seems like um, right now, I think the direction may, may well be up. Um, and I think that's it for today. Just want to see if there's any questions about anything we covered today. Um, and I'll stop right there. First off, Itai, that was, that was wonderful. And this is great news for my upcoming trip to Europe. So thank you for uh, letting me know that my dollars might go just a little bit further. It's already Itai, close. To, it's already close to 1.1, I think, with the euro. Itai, I would think with the more expensive, with interest rates rising, one of the things we would see is fewer buy, stock buybacks. So when wouldn't, wouldn't that be when that be normally the case because the money's more expensive. Yeah, it is normally more the case, but it. I mean, of course, it depends how much rates go up, right? Is it is it four rate hikes? Is it three rate hikes? I think. One, two rate hikes are not very meaningful, but once you get beyond that, when you have such a levered economy, 
I think what makes this so different than any other time in recent history since the global financial crisis is that we have real inflation. There was no other period since this QE period started since the global financial crisis that we had, you know, five, six percent CPI. So up until now, every time the Fed was hawkish and was starting to taper or ended QE, the first 20 percent equity drop drawdown they came back and did QE immediately again, and they cut interest rates right away. And the question right now really is, are they still able to do that with CPI at 6%? And if the answer is no, then there's a lot more trouble than we've gotten used to in the last 15 years. Itai, Ita, how, how high do you think the Fed funds rate could go before the macro economy would be in trouble servicing the debt payments? I mean, at a point where it would be, it would be very uh, a very precarious situation for the federal government or for the Federal Reserve, shall I say? Um, yeah, I don't I don't know the exact answer for that. You know, the economy is really really complex. Um, I don't I don't even know if there is an exact answer, but I would say that you know interest payments on the debt at very very low. Uh, very, very low rates were already, what, 14 to 18 percent at 10-year treasury and one and a half percent. So 14 percent. So, so imagine if, you know, doubling one and a half percent to three percent already takes you 28 percent of GDP as interest payment on the debt. So, yeah, I mean, at, at these levels of, of, of debt, any, any incremental increase to interest rates is, is problematic. That's why I don't necessarily think that they can get away with being too aggressive. Um, but I think that, that that's what's going to make 2022 really, really interesting because, um, you know, this is the first time the Fed has to deal with real inflation. So if you think about it, we've got like 26 trillion in debt. If interest rates go to 4%, that's over a trillion dollars in interest payment. We take in about 3.8 trillion. We pay out about 4.8 trillion and, and have about 400 to 500 billion of that's interest payments right now. So I mean, you're you're basically doubling the interest payment just by going to four percent, and and it does start becoming unsustainable if we get to six seven percent interest rate. That's why, like Ek is saying, they have a real motivation not to raise interest rates past a certain point. And that's probably about three and a quarter percent on the Fed's rate. Right, but but imagine if CPI stays at six percent, that's still half of what inflation is. Mm -hmm. That's why that's a problem. sense. Uh, what other what other questions are on everybody's mind? It's all open floor. People have been asking great, great questions in the chat and here. So feel free to share whatever's on your mind. Ethan, while we're talking about one thing that we haven't talked about really are any um, um, world conflicts, let's say you know, things that, things that are not financial. So, you know, the world's getting pretty dicey and, you know, we don't know what's going on with Russia. We don't know what's going on with China. Um, it seems like, um, again, 2022 could be interesting. Some, you know, could get some real fireworks. How, how do you see those type of things? And I mean, I don't even know the, what those types of things are, but turmoil, world turmoil, let's call it potential military action, things like that. You know, how's that affect all of this? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, geopolitical risk is definitely increasing. So you have first Russia on one hand with Ukraine, but I don't know if that's more, that's too substantial for equities than it would be, let's say, for energy prices, maybe wheat uh, in, in Ukraine specifically. But Taiwan, I think, is very, very material. We actually just talked about it the other day, where, you know, if China makes a move on Taiwan, how is that going to impact the global chip uh, shortage? Um, where they will control what more than 90% of global chip production at that point. So there's a lot of, I, I agree with you, it's very, very difficult to predict yeah. these type of geopolitical risks. Um, historically, war hasn't been massively negative on equities, but I think, you know, potentially that could be very different for inflationary look and other things like that. If let's say China makes a move in Taiwan, you know, what would the US do if that happens? And I think it's, it's, it's very speculative at this point, but I agree with you. The geopolitical risks are definitely increasing. Yeah, I, I actually think the Ukraine could involve a lot more than oil or more than energy in terms of financial um, consequences. 
because I mean, we're not going to war with Russia, but not, not physical war with Russia, but you can get into all kinds of economic wars. And as soon as you start getting into the economic wars, you know, you, you start involving Europe, you start involving the whole world and it could just, it could get crazy. I agree. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, a great, and a great form of warfare in a way, I haven't thought about this until now, but to, to force the government, to force our interest rates higher. So if someone were to force our interest rates higher, think about what that does to the stability of our country. So that, you know, that could be a war tactic. And there, I'll, I'll take it one step further. I actually read uh, uh, a geopolitical report that says that one of Russia's quote, secret weapons they've been practicing on is cyber attacks on the United States in which one of them includes uh, attacking the, the NYSC and basically shutting off trading. And what would that do to financial stability? Um, mm -hmm. So just another thing. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I mean, that's always been a fear with electronic trading and, and, yeah. the, banking, and the banking system itself. Right. I, I think a geopolitical crisis is that Larry needs a good haircut and a shave. Haircut, yes. Shaves <laughs> and shave will wait on. Keep, keep it's, getting it's getting cold here in Chicago. I need it. Well, that's right. We, we forgot. We forgot all, all about that cold even exists. So yeah. good luck to you. Uh, Itai, I'm getting some really good questions in the chat. And I'm going to go one by one. Do you do you see do you see a reserve currency regime change in the future? Uh, I don't I don't think it's 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 imminent. I think that you know you could have potentially made that argument a few months ago uh, when we talked about this. And is the Fed really going to continue to constantly print money and do what they're doing even despite inflation and this increase in um, this increase in, in uh, asset price, et cetera, but we are seeing that they are willing to act on it, or at least it seems that way. Um, so as a result, we're seeing the dollar already appreciating. Um, I think it's possible eventually, it probably will have to happen as the US becomes smaller and smaller and no one country can hold the reserve currency, but I don't think it's in the immediate, immediate future. Got it. Um, and I think another question along that, at a high level, what would a regime change mean? So if it, if it did happen, what does that mean? A basket of currencies, a single currency? Yeah, I mean, oil and commodities will not be priced in dollars anymore. Uh, debt will probably not be taken in dollars anymore. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of things like that. So again, like a lot of these events in history, um, and, again, and, and again, many, many empires rose and fall in their reserve currencies uh, lasted for a while until they didn't. But these things are usually not a one day event that all of a sudden, okay, the US dollar is no longer the reserve currency. They take decades really to, to, to materialize and slowly but surely there's another currency introduced, let's say it's 70% dollars, 30% euro, so I'm, I'm just speculating, or, or maybe even 10% Bitcoin, who knows. Um, but it's technically gradual and happens, and it happens over time um, and not necessarily you know, a one and done event, but generally it would mean that global debts won't be done in USD anymore. Um, commodities won't be priced in USD anymore. And the Federal Reserve would just handle the internal affairs of the United States. I understand. I wanna ask uh, another question then I'll stop the recording, uh, which is let's, let's say the debt burden becomes unsupportable and our only other options are defaults or even restructure the debt with debt holders. Is restructure like what would ha what would happen if that burden became unsupportable? Which route do you think we'd go, and what might be the implications? I think based on recent history, they will try as much as possible to inflate it away by debasing the currency. So cutting interest rates and even going negative if they needed to. Right, and then then potentially even banning cash because negative interest rates didn't didn't work in Europe. Uh, mainly because, believe it or not, people were just hoarding cash, so they don't. But I think this is one of the moves to eventually digital currencies, digital euro, digital dollars, um, for two reasons. One is they're able to drop helicopter money directly without dealing with all. Because now we've we've seen the first large experimentation during COVID with helicopter money drops. I think in future crises, governments are going to do more of it. It's a lot easier if they have like what China did with the e one, they have a wallet for the citizens and they can just drop it directly. They can also monitor the impact on the on consumption and what people are spending it on. 
that's definitely one thing. Uh, but I also think governments are eventually wanting to get rid of cash. So people won't be able to hoard money anymore and negative interest rates will actually coerce them to spend it. Another thing yeah. to look at in the future is the possibility of like hundred year bonds. Yeah. It's already, it's already happening in some countries. I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording here and then we'll just open it up to free for all afterward. Cause I know people keep trading uh, back and forth. Thank you.